Weiner and identified by Mark, a very, very skilled naturalist as Mark Weiner, and then named by Scott just before he left. And he thought, well, Pinchy is obviously a very good name for a crab, and Weiner is a very good surname for a crab if it was if you were discovered by Mark Weiner. And therefore, Pinchy Weiner, of course, is possibly the most epic name a crab has ever had. Pinchy Weiner. <laughs> I laugh every time I hear that because I hear I hear Scott's voice. It's very amusing. Anyway, we're sort of heading towards Pinchy Weiner's old domain. And Brent Leo Smith is still off the vehicle, which of course is obvious to me because I can see his vehicle. Uh, this will give us an opportunity, of course, to see William Dorenbrach's uh, Kruger National, at least uh, Paul Kruger beard. Hello, William. Thank you, Ellen. I believe you posted a picture of Paul Kruger on the Safari Live Twitter. That's very good. Um, Liam? Yes. Liam, are you, going to, are you going to shave your beard into the Paul Kruger style? Yes, you can give me your shaver. Okay. I am going to give Liam my shaver this evening, and by tomorrow morning he will look like Paul Kruger. He will, of course, have to remove his hat and plaster his hair onto his forehead with some kind of engine grease. Your last drive. Wonderful. Okay, Viam is going on leave tomorrow, everybody. That's why he's looking so relaxed. Bye, Viam. Bye, Viam. <laughs> All right, let's go and see a little bit further south. That's the direction in which we're heading now. That's south. I think I may have bypassed Pinchy Weiner's nest, unfortunately. Uh, we, we, we're pulling a passenger, are we? Uh, and Anne on Twitter, you think the name Pinchy Weiner is better suited to a British public school boy? Uh, well, perhaps. I think it's an excellent crab name, though. I, I do take your point, though. Uh, we are now dragging a fairly substantial amount of vegetation, which I'm going to have to remove. Um, Hold on, everyone. We will be on our way shortly. Of course, this is, as I went, read a wonderful blog about us today, a very kind blog by somebody whose name I forget, which is not unusual. Uh, and they just said, oh, it's, it's real, you know, it's not like over-edited reality TV because sometimes there are technical glitches and sometimes um, there are problems, such as this enormous branch that is under the car. <laughs> Brian? This is not an insubstantial tree. <laughs> I must just tell you. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's um it's uh, it's right under here. You hear the leopard? If he heard it. Okay. Cool. Let me just kick that out. Sorry, everybody. We will be on our way shortly. <laughs> OK, here we go. It's out now. It's almost out. You've seen the leopard. Well done. Is it very thicket? Okay. Well done. Did they chase you? No, they didn't. Oh, well, that's, didn't a, that, that's a relief. But I, you know these animals that are called the loved one? In yes. Front? They tend to come out of bushes like very, very, very fast. Yes. yes. Fortunately, they didn't see me. But oh, they good. But they are in there. Just here. Yeah, out for the All right. 80 meters. Do you mind if I make go, my no, way I'm in there? I'm going to go in and see if we 
give you a hand. Okay. Well done. Bye well bye. done. Good job. This is excellent news. How on earth did Final Control know about that? Right. Ah, VM told him. VM obviously heard them calling while I was yakking away incoherently about the log under the car. Here's the saffron tree. Hello, Evie. You're on YouTube. This is your first drive, and you say you're loving it. Well, Evie, with any luck, it's about to get a whole lot better. This is the saffron tree that Brent was talking about, and we're going to drive in here and see if we can't find the leopards. So what Brent was talking about was that this is obviously very thick in here. You can see, you can imagine, if you were walking through here trying to see a leopard, it would not be an easy task. Incredibly thick. Brent has done a very fine job here. Um, right. Brian, any ideas? Let's just switch off and listen. Now, like I said earlier, leopards make a very big noise when they're mating. So Brenty is going to drive back in here and give us a hand because he obviously saw exactly where they were. Let's just head in here. I kind of feel it's only fair if he gets to see them first, but on the off chance that they move, I think we should, we should try anyway. Don't worry about the trees, everybody. I know it can sometimes seem that this is a bit sort of aggressive amongst the bushes, but we are in a big thicket and most of these trees will pop up straight behind us. You got them. Brian, uh, Brent says they're in this area here. I think let's hand you over to Brent because I think he knows exactly where they are. So, Kirsten, tell Brent we'll, we'll hand over to him and he can take you in there. So, I managed to find them on foot, as you're all aware. Now, finding them with the vehicle is a different story. Of course, I am nimble enough to s slither between bushes, uh, which our vehicles are not. So there were, there's the saffron tree, there's the saffron tree. It must be here. I spotted them when I was down there. Now, they could have moved slightly. They didn't see me, fortunately. They could have quite easily just moved off. So you go again, James. Copy, well done. So James has just heard them, he hasn't had a visual. Mm. We're just up ahead of us here, so we're gonna go around. Now, it's really useful having both of us here uh, because of the nature of these tickets we're dealing with at the moment. Oh, 
be, uh, I think I should try to get onto the other side of the drainage. So it seems like they've moved a little bit since I saw them on foot. So they were here. And so it sounds like they look a bit further north now. Exciting times nonetheless in scratch of leopards. So much of the fun. Okay, over to James, they're just in front of us and they've found them. There she is, everybody. There's the female. I can hear the male growling. She's going to look for him. He's in the thicket. He's right here. He's right here. Yeah, they're going to mate again. They're going to mate. Oh, wow. irritated she is. She's so angry. Look at her ears flattened back against her head. And as we came round the corner here, she gave us a little hiss because we didn't see her immediately. Well, I say we. I mean, I didn't see her immediately. Brian did. And just look how irritated she is. Not with us. That's just with the mating process. This is how it is with them. And she's limping a bit, it looks like to me. That's... Not completely unusual when they mate, of course, because they do sort of, well, not quite fight with each other, but they are quite aggressive. And so sometimes when he's dismounting and trying to hold her down so that she doesn't swat him, he can kind of give her a bit of a, a smack on the leg or on the shoulders. Now, look where he is, everyone, and tell me how on earth, if you came, if you came through this area, how on earth you would have any idea there was a leopard there. That's the magnificent Tingana, who gives us endless, endless, wonderful views. Brian, I'll try and reverse a bit. Let's just wait for Brent to move. Brent's going to get a decent view of Tingana now. He's right next to Tingana. He's just opposite us. So I think he will have an amazing view of him. That's fantastic. Isn't that beautiful? Sorry, Brent is now black screen, so he, he can't... <laughs> We can't use the incredible picture that he's got, unfortunately. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to reverse a little bit back because I think he's out in the open, so we'll get a decent view of him. That's Tandy. Oh, look at her. Sometimes I do wish I had an enormous lens like Brent's. Fantastic. But right, Brian. Isn't that stunning? So that is the wonderful Tingana, dominant male lecker of this area. So I know that some of you have been uh, are watching for the very first time. And this is Tingana, who provides the bulk of our male leopard viewing. Now, the best way to identify him is to look at his, other than his very obvious, magnificent size, is his spot pattern just above the whiskers. And Tingana 
as a spot pattern that is 5-5. Five, five. He's got five spots. Left and five spots right. They're actually quite a complicated arrangement. I think it's best just enjoy him for now. I'll draw those for you uh, when we finished with the sighting. Because it's quite difficult to see from here. So on the left or his right, he's got four and then one on top. And then... That uh, scrabbling of uh, plastic you can hear is Brent Leo Smith either eating a battery or putting one in something. Brent, what are you doing? Oh, I see, it's for the VR rig. Isn't he great? And the color of him juxtaposed there is just too special. Now, she will come over here. When she's here, she comes, here she comes. Fantastic, look at this. Are we just gonna be very quiet? This is just unbelievable. Isn't this wonderful? They're only about, well, maybe 10 feet from us. Just listen. also see very clearly how much smaller than the male she is. And when you see them on their own, they don't tend to look quite so little. But you can see she's very irritated. It's sore for her. I know that there are a few of you watching for the first time, and Erin, um, yeah, this is a good time to join us. We don't always have this every day, I've got to tell you. Evie, sorry, not Erin, Evie. JD, you want to know if Tundi has a scrape or scratch on her back? I don't know, I haven't seen, but she will, over the course of this mating period, develop a probably some, some bleeding wounds over her neck. You saw there how he grabbed the back of her neck while they were mating. And that's just to hold her down and stop her really giving him a swat when he withdraws. And it's a painful process when he withdraws, obviously, because his penis is barbed as is the case with all cats. And I think that what that does is that it helps, it creates a contraction in the, in the female's sort of tubes, if you like, and that helps with the fertilization process. It's so wonderful to have them to ourselves like this. Out in the open, poor old Jamie had them in a massive thicket this morning. And now they're right out in the open. And that colour, they're lying on sedges. Beautiful kind of verdant, soft sedges. It looks like the most wonderful bed to lie on. As you say, the drama of it is so exhilarating. We were very lucky with the timing. Very lucky Brent found them on foot first. Now look at her foot. There, there, there. Uh, can you see on the foot there, Brian? She's got a nasty injury there. Now I suspect quite strongly that that is from the claws of Tingana. In fact, it looks like a slice straight across the pad there. Ugh, that looks like a quite nasty wound. And that will be, I suspect, quite strongly from the, the fighting that they've been doing while they've been mating. She is just stunning. <laughs> the 
this is just wonderful. What I'm going to do, we're just going to sit here and see what happens. Brent, of course, is just behind us. enjoying the sighting just before he goes on leave. He actually has an ox wagon, does Vian. Here we go again, everyone. See how she's limping? That's sore. Now she will have to really kind of encourage him three times in the last ten minutes. Look at that. Oops. from sort of a beautiful cat to terrifying vicious. You can imagine that sound charging at you. Blood curdling. Now like I say, this is the third time we've seen them we've seen them mate. Now, Gracie, you are you're in Ohio, as we know, and Gracie, you want to know if it's a baby leopard. No, Gracie, it's not. It's just a very small female. Well, it's actually a pretty average-sized female, Gracie, but as you will see when you keep watching the safaris, the males are much bigger than the females. So she probably weighs in the region of 45 to 50 kilograms, which is about 110 pounds. And he probably weighs in the region of 70 to 75 kilograms, I would say. And if you multiply that by 2.2, you get to roughly 180 pounds. So, I mean, it's not quite double, but it's about two-thirds again the size. So that's why he looks so much bigger, Gracie. He's also quite pale. I, hadn't, I haven't noticed that before. He's quite a pale-colored fellow. She is also, I mean, the family of Sh Karula, Shadow, and Tundi are not known for their kind of golden color. They're much more yellow leopards than they are gold. And the recently deceased Quatile was an example of a tremendously golden leopard. Brian, would it help you if I reversed back some very slightly? Hmm. I'm just going to reverse slightly. I want to do this before Tundi's desires are further awakened just so that we are stationary when she moves again. Is that okay? Hello, survey. Survey? Um, a very valid question at this time. How long is their gestation period? Survey, so their gestation period is 110 days, roughly. Uh, so just, uh, just under four months, three and a half months. Um, it will vary, obviously, just a little bit, as it does with human beings. But that's basically what the, what the gestation period is. And she will then give birth, as has her mother and sister very recently, two months ago in the case of her mother, and one month ago in the case of her sister. And they will give birth in a sort of secluded den. Now, it's not quite as brilliantly secluded as, say, for the hyenas or the wild dogs. And they can do it in a termite mound. In fact, Shadow did give birth in a termite mound this time. But often, it's a sort of cave or rocky overhang. And that's the most vulnerable time for the cubs, because they're not quite as well defended as dogs or as hyena cubs, simply because they don't have the ability to dig as is the case with hyena cubs. And they also, unlike the wild dogs, don't have a nursemaid to look after them when the adults go of hunting. Now, 
now. Brent Lear Smith, of course, has got a 400 millimeter lens on the end of his camera, which means that he will be able to take a picture of one spot of Tingana. So if they do mate again, I suspect he will take some spectacular photographs, which I would encourage you to ask him to produce very quickly. I am filming this, of course, or taking pictures with my cell phone. Hello, kitty, kitty, bang, bang. Um, kitty, kitty, bang, bang, you want to know? <laughs> Sorry. You, <laughs> you want to know how long it is that the female will remain in estrus? Kitty, kitty, bang, bang. The female will remain in estrus probably about a week. Uh, well, the mating period will probably go on five to seven days. And then she'll come out of estrus and go off, even if she isn't successfully conceived. That estrus period, period will end because, you know, the male and female cannot continue at this rate for any length of time. Now, just, Brian, can I ask you to zoom out very slightly and then tilt down slightly? beautiful white flowers. You can see a white button sedge is the big white flower. And then I just spotted a plant or a flower that was identified for me again. I'd forgotten it by Judy H. the other day, oleander. Um, that's these lovely little white flowers that you can see there. Isn't that beautiful? Blowing gently in this wind on the sea line. And they grow in this very kind of inundated soil. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Hello, Virginia in Kentucky. Um, I don't really know the answer to this, but I'm going to assume uh, you say you know the female gets sore from mating, but does the male also? Um, I imagine, yes, it probably is quite painful to him. You see how he has to really be encouraged to perform the act, as it were. He doesn't um, sort of, unlike with the lions, where if a female moves, he'll kind of follow her around. It's very different with the leopard, although the mechanism is actually very similar. So I'm sure after a week of mating, yes, I think it probably is very sore for him. But uh, and initially... Not probably, initially probably not quite as sore for him as it is for her, because he could, of course, could just walk away if it was an unpleasant experience. And it's an interesting one that, you know, um, and to think about the drivers that make mammals of different sexes want to mate. Uh, the end result, the end goal from a genetic point of view is the same, and that is to produce a genetic legacy or to produce offspring. You can see the light coming out now, beautiful colors coming. Um, but from a male point of view, of course, there's no risk. But from a female point of view, there is a lot of risk involved. So she has to go through the expensive, more nutritionally and physiologically expensive process of pregnancy, and then giving birth and then lactating and looking after the cub, where, of course, he doesn't have to worry about any of that. He's just got to go. I mean, his, his sole role in this whole thing is to do what he's doing now. And I think what that means is that for the male, it is, um, you know, there's no thought about that. Well, I mean, there's no conscious thought in her part either. But there is a hormonal kind of change in her that will not be the same for him where she is driven to this kind of motherhood. And I think he's basically, <clears throat> he's pleasure seeking. That's the only reason he's hanging around here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think you'll find that's quite similar with a lot of males. I don't know if I'm expressing myself uh, clearly enough here, but he won't be feeling any kind of paternal drivers at the moment or ever. His drive to breed is, is driven purely, probably, or largely by pleasure, and that, in turn, will produce his genetic legacy. Whereas for a female, that is very different. Very 
very quiet sort of afternoon. There is a little bit of bird song, the odd spider, hu spider hunting wasp buzzing past, a couple of Franklins in the background, some blue wax bulls going. There you can hear them now. And then a wind blowing. It's been a beautifully cloudy day, unusual out here. Also, they've been spotted by some rattling cysticulars that seem to be moving. Oh, look, 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 look. Brian, you see the little blue wax bull there? There's the blue wax bull, everyone. Yeah, did he move? Oh, nasty little blighter. He moved off there. It's a dreadful pity. Right, well, it doesn't seem to me that there's a great deal going on here. I think we'll sit here definitely for the next little while. There's no real point in moving on when we have two beautiful leopards in view. And we'll just see what they do. There are also some yellow flowers around here while we wait for them. I don't know what those are. I'm going to ask Brent Leo Smith if he knows what they are. Brent Leo Smith. Do you know what those yellow flowers are? He's frantically looking through a book, I think. I don't know what they are. But it is very lovely to see the flowers. And then we have a... A what? OK. Brent, he doesn't know. He's, he's got a wonderful book, though. And then another plant that was identified for me by Judy H., the top botanist on Twitter is this other long-leafed thing here in front of us, which also produces sort of yellow flowers, and that's called Waltheria, which I should have known, and I've learned it at least a hundred times and forgotten it each time. Thank you, Judy, if you're watching. Now, I mentioned the weather a little bit earlier on. I think it was about 25 degrees Celsius, which is, ooh, you see how far... 29, sorry, 29 degrees Celsius and 84 degrees Fahrenheit. So very pleasant autumnal temperatures. We'll see how long those last. Then now, if you look at his nose, Brian, you can see a bit of a wound. And that could well be from a slap that she's given him. That's why he holds her down as he withdraws, because she'll whip around and whack him with her extended claws, vicious claws that they have. And you've seen her with her face, a face like thunder, deeply unimpressed after they've finished mating always. Now, Dolly, a very good question from you. Uh, you want to know about how on earth he would find a female who wanted to mate with him again, uh, given that they don't live close to each other. Dolly, it's mainly through smell, and she will actually seek him out rather than the other way around. So what will happen, she'll come into estrus, she'll uh, urinate, and that will, if he comes across that, will, it will be very obvious to him uh, that she is in estrus. He's able to sense that. But she will also seek the male out. And so where he marks his territory, she will smell, and she will then follow that scent. She'll also call, and that will attract him, and they'll meet up. And uh, this is what ensues, basically. What was that, Brent? Okay, so Brenty reckons that yellow flowers from the wart family. It's a distinctly unattractive name for a flower. And this, of course, is what happens with cats quite often. They lie down and do nothing.
So, Sandy, another a very good question, because we've seen that the females who come into estrus in this area will often mate with more than one male. And you say, well, you know, if she's with him all the time, and till, you know, the whole estrus cycle, when does she ever find time to go mate with another male? Um, Sandy, I think what you'll find is, it's a very good question, one I actually haven't thought about, but I think what you'll find is that they will go into estrus, she'll mate with a male like this, and if she doesn't fall pregnant, uh, it's quite likely that she'll then, you know, she'll seek out another, could seek out another male. It's also possible, and I don't know if this is the case or not, that she will spend five days or so with a male like this, not complete her estrus cycle, and move on and try and find another male if he's around the place. So you also might find, Sandy, that the estrus cycle or the uh, mating cycle lasts longer than it takes for her to conceive. So she might conceive now, for example, not realize it and still seek out other males in the area to mate with. And what Sandy means, everybody, is that we have an idea that they mate with different males in order to confuse the males or con them into thinking that they have born cubs. Because, of course, one of the leading killers of leopard cubs is other leopards, other male leopards. And that practice of infanticide is a major killer of all mammal youngsters, even human beings until fairly recently. And I think it's just a fascinating subject that we don't know about. Uh, we don't, we, we're, not, we're never actually 100% sure as to who the father of the cubs are. And I know a number of people have seen pictures of Karula's cubs and of Shadow's cubs and identified various uh, markings on Tingana that they believe they've seen on the cubs of the other leopards. I'm always slightly suspicious of that. I'm just not convinced that we're able to do that. Um, and the only way to tell paternity for sure is through DNA analysis. And Panthera is doing quite a lot of that DNA analysis as we speak. We've collected Tingana's scat. We haven't collected Tundis, as far as I know. We've collected Karula's, Shadow's, and Brent recently collected the fresh dung of Gichima. So that will also be very telling because he seems to be fairly unrelaxed, and we're going to chat about that during the fireside chat today, which ensues at 6 o'clock our time. Canada Keith, that's an interesting one, and I mean, maybe we can hand this across to some of our uh, female viewers who perhaps had babies, because uh, I suspect that the, the sensation is fairly similar. You want to know how it is that a female knows she's pregnant or not. Um, well, when a female becomes pregnant, of course, the hormone progesterone is produced in quite large volumes, and I suspect that creates a mental change. Uh, which in turn, you know, I'm sure makes all sorts of changes inside a female's body, and the same with a leopard. But her need to mate, uh, certainly with a leopard, will disappear almost entirely. And so I don't know, I mean, uh, whether she registers or not that she's pregnant, I'm not sure. I think it's probably highly unlikely. I don't think there's a process of thinking, oh, there's a little one on the way. It just kind of happens. And of course, unlike with, say, a human being, estrus here is, um, is not disguised. So, I mean, I know this is sometimes quite difficult for some people to hear, simply because we're talking about humans as, as animals, which, I mean, at the end of the day, we are. But estrus in a human being is disguised, so we never know when a, uh, if, if you go back to a Stone Age society, you would never know whether a female was receptive or um, ready to have a child or ready to conceive or not. Look at him rolling over there. But with a leopard, she's advertising it. She's showing that she's in estrus and showing that she's ready to mate, same as it is with a baboon or something like that. And so when she comes out of estrus, of course, it's normally because she's pregnant or because the mating cycle hasn't worked. And 
she'll then come into Eastress again very soon and she'll advertise that fact. The light is just absolutely stunning now. The sun has come out from behind the thick clouds. The doves are calling. The leopards are resting on a bed of beautiful green sedges. We, very luckily, have got this leopard sighting all entirely to ourselves, which is rather nice, I think. Hello, Ivan, all the way from Serbia. Ivan, an interesting question from you about how many cubs a leopard can have. Well, you'll read in the textbooks potentially six, but I think that's, I've certainly never seen that. I have heard of four, but that's extremely rare as well. Three and two, much more common, sometimes one. And uh, Brent Leo Smith says it has happened that there've been eight in captivity before. So, but out here in the wild, Two and three, two and three would be the most common numbers. Of course, they may give birth to more, and you know, then they'll die almost immediately. But it's two and three out here is the most common. Sometimes one, very seldom four. And if she has four, even if she has three, it's highly unlikely that they will all survive. Two and one are much easier to raise. Then you want to know how many nipples they have. They've got four nipples. And they're what we call, I've forgotten the term for them actually, but they're exactly where they would be on a house cat, underneath the belly. So Brent Leo Smith is still here because he's trying to get a virtual reality shot of them mating, but unfortunately they've given up now and they're going to go on a border patrol, see what they can find else. Thank you, Brent. Bye, Brent. Thank you, Paul Kruger. We do need to actually, you should take the, you should go home and show them Paul Kruger's um, ox wagon. That would be quite interesting. Victoria. Hey? I think there's a piece of it in Victoria Museum. Probably is. What's it about? Bye. <laughs> I'm not joking about VM's ox wagon. He's really, he's got this ancient sort of caravan thing. Let's move a bit. I'm just gonna move a little bit here. And while I do that, Silas, you're in Port Elizabeth. You want to know if the male produces sufficient sperm. Sorry, Charlotte, not Silas. Silas is a character from the Da Vinci Code, um, an albino monk. Uh, Charlotte, you're in Port Elizabeth. And you want to know if a male can produce sufficient sperm for each copulation to produce uh, a sort of an effective mating. Um, Charlotte, the short answer to that, of course, is that a male e ejaculation produces millions and millions of sperm. Um, and only one of those is required to fertilize the egg. So even if he produces three or four, that's going to be, in theory, insufficient. I, I'm sure at the beginning of the cycle that it, it um, is a lot more in the ejaculate than there is at the end. But I also think that it probably stays up there for a while. I don't think that it all sort of comes out, if you know what I mean. So while I've no doubt at the end there's probably less, um, maybe the process of mating creates a res physiological response in him that makes him produce more. That's also possible. Uh, but I. I don't know, it's difficult to say whether every single mating would produce enough sperm, but I think because you only need one per fertilization, it's possible. There you can see them in sweet repose under the bush there. And just off to the back, you can hear a rattling cysticula calling. Now, Olnik, 
very good question. Of course, this is hungry work, what they're doing now. Well, not particularly what they're doing right now, but the mating process is hungry work. You want to know if they hunt together during their uh, mating period. Yes, they do, quite a lot. And certainly the best example of that that I've seen was when Tingana was mating with Karula, and they killed a young buffalo. Now, for a leopard to kill a young buffalo on its own is really pretty difficult, if not impossible, and I suspect they killed that buffalo together. So the fact that they are together does allow them to work as a bit of a team if they're killing. They weren't always there. I mean, sometimes she'll kill, kill something and he'll just lift it from her. Otherwise, he'll kill something and begrudgingly share bits and pieces of it with her. And like you can see, they don't seem to be doing a great deal at the moment. <laughs> so, a nice one. Um, just for those of you who are new viewers, we do have a number of male leopards around the place, and the biggest one in the area at the moment is a chap called the Anderson male. Now, the Anderson male, Aaron, you want to know how much bigger he is than Tingana. Tingana is a good-sized male leopard. He's not the biggest I've ever seen. He's bigger than Mvula, though, I reckon. Uh, quite substantially so, I think. But Anderson is big. You've seen him, haven't you, Brian? And you reckon that he is... He's a monster. He's a monster. <laughs> so, the heaviest male leopard of this area was, is a male leopard called Tyson down in the south of the Sabi Sands. They've actually weighed him. They had to dart him, and they have weighed him. And I think he came in at 93 kilograms. Now, that in pounds is about 200, 205, 200 pounds or so. So he's, uh, I mean, that's enormous. I'd say that this leopard is about 75 to 80 kilograms, and so 180 pounds or so. So, I mean, there could be a 30 pound difference between the two. Certainly, the Anderson male looks a bit thicker set. He's probably not much taller, maybe an inch taller or so but he's definitely thicker set, and he's got a much bigger neck. But, you know, the reason they can get along with each other and manage to keep territories next to each other, so if the Anderson is in the west, he's bigger than Tingana, Tingana in turn is bigger than Mvula, and they're able to, sort of, a smaller leopard like Mvula is able to maintain a territory in the face of bigger leopards simply because they don't want to have a physical conflict. They're very afraid of physical conflict, our leopards, because of the risks involved. An injured leopard is going to starve very quickly. All right, let's get an update from Brent. He's moved out of the sighting. Let's see where he's going to go. We're going to stay here, and if these leopards do anything, we'll be right back with you. Hi, guys. It feels like I haven't seen you in a while, even though I was right there. Isn't that awesome to have those leopards? And uh, always fun to go find them on foot. One of my favorite things to do, track big cats. So I heard a rumor that there was elephants on their way into Juma, and I do feel like I haven't seen many elephants in the last, well, today. <laughs> so sounds like a nice, really big herd. So I'm gonna go see if we can catch up with them. chilly for, for, for what it has been, quite pleasant. And sun breaking through the cloud. There is still quite a bit of cloud around. It's going to be very interesting to see what the weather holds on the sun arise for safari. if anything's out in the open on the vast Impala Plain. And there is nothing. Now, I'm hoping the wildebeest are going to start ratting, so we should start be seeing them on these open plains. Survey. I'm wondering if we can be able to just show you quickly. 
this incredible haze, uh, all the dust that's been kicked up during the day. So very, very hazy. So it actually smells a lot like dust at the moment. So how would you describe dust, Liam? Mm. Light. It's a sort of a light, but it's a, it's a very earthy smell, a very sandy smell. It smells smell. like Kruger. It smells like Kruger, yes. It smells, it smells like the low fault uh, when it starts to get dry. But also, every now and then, as we go past certain flowering plants, we happen to drive over a poor basil, or, 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 um, or we drive over some aniseed. You get that burst of freshness, sort of licorice and, and basil. But uh, generally, at the moment today, with this wind, it smells a lot like dust, dirt. Not dirty dirt, though. Good, clean dirt we get out here. Oh, Brazo says we need wild dogs, Brent, and I agree wholeheartedly. And if I had a track, I'd be on it, but unfortunately they are still far to the south of us. So hopefully they will be heading back at some point. Uh, just remember now they are mating at the moment. And then we'll be searching for potential den sites. So I did hear the invested breakaways were in the Manioletti. So quite far to the north. And the sands pack was down near Skukuza in the Kruger. Good for a few animals along these lovely open areas. Not today. Hi, Alana! Alana says she loves watching uh, these safaris because at home in Scotland we've got, she's got zero wild animals. Well, if I remember correctly, there's a few. I think she'll have the odd roebuck, uh, red deer, fallow deer, and of course you have some incredible salmon and a trout fishing. Now here we go, we've got a bird who hasn't quite left the roost yet. Well not the roost, but European eaters, quite a lot of the other migrants have already left. And we've got a couple of them darting up here. I know they're sorry there and they are being quite troublesome. There is there. There we go. Hawking for insects. That's that type of behavior, that's what it's called. So you'll find whoa there he goes. Awesome, well done, Viv. So, a lot of the, the oh, sorry, I didn't, you're still going there, Viv. Yo, jump here. Uh, a lot of the the birds that feed on the wing like that, so not something like a roller that tends to perch and then then go after something, but birds that feed on the wing, so swallows, swifts, uh, bee eaters, etc. It's very, very strange. Well, not strange. It's actually very clever. They basically feed at different trophic levels in the air. So uh, bee eaters will be quite low, just above the treetops, and then certain swallows also in that zone. relaxed herd of elephants. Sometimes in this wind, Ellie's can be a little bit unrelaxed. How you doing, Dolly? Uh, Dolly's in Ontario, Canada. Dolly's wondering about the weather. Something we ponder quite frequently. And Dolly would like to know, is there still any chance of any rain coming? Or is it pretty much done? There's always a chance, Dolly, but I, I feel we're probably not going to get any significant rain. If we do get any rain, it might be a little drizzle, uh, but I, I don't feel we're going to get any big rains. I think they're pretty much done. You can actually feel it in the air. It's, even when it's hot now, it's a very dry heat. We've lost all that humidity. Oh, the 
and parlor we seem to find today are the boys without the girlfriends. And where all the girls are. Oh, it's quite pretty in that light. Very pretty antelope in parlor. Ahead. Now, in this strong windy conditions we're dealing with at the moment, uh, we'll probably find that these guys uh, are going to move a little bit later. As the sun gets a little bit lower, they're going to head out towards uh, the uh, big open areas like the one we're about to come into now. And the reason for that is with this wind and stuff, obviously. Oh, suicidal scrub here. That was close. Strange enough, I read a fascinating little folklore uh, tale about a scrub hair today. And it's an old Bushman folklore. Now, if he turns around, you'll notice he's actually got a split lip. And the moon and the scrub hair were having an argument about man. Now, the first man had died, or one of the first men had died. And uh, the moon was arguing with the hare that they should reincarnate the man. She has the power like she does every, every so often. The moon gets reincarnated. Now, the moon is a, a female in Bushman culture. And the scrub hare disagreed and said we should leave the terrible creature to rot and not do anything. And the uh, moon got very angry and hit the scrub hare with a shambok pod. I mean, not a shambok pod, a uh, uh, for corn. Oh, vanished quick, quick. Anyway, and so whack the, the hair in the face and split its, split its upper lip. Now, the hair was very angry and fought back. And those indentations you can see on the moon are from hair's feet. And, and the split in the hair's lip is from moon. So there we go. Lovely little bit of folklore from up north in Africa. been seeing too often and too many of uh, since that last late rain. Let's go have a closer squiz at them. It is a, a member, member of the equine family we have here. It's of course far more closely related. Oh, here comes a howling gale. Uh, it is of course far more closely related to the noble beast of burden known as a donkey. And it is the majestic horse. Lots of impala in the way now. Let's go through them. There we go. Hello, zebra. You'll notice quite a few of the animals will be a little bit jumpy in this very windy weather. Likely to be a few more Another spread. Have hey, you got some more there, Vim? Mm. Ah, yeah, Vim's already spotted others. So it's unlikely that we'll just find a female and a and a, a foal. There's likely to be quite a few more around. Oh, there you guys disappearing. Get off into the thickets now. There we go. Nice, Vim. being very, very helpful to us this evening, the zebras. And as it gets drier, we are going to start getting bigger groups of them again, particularly around permanent water holes. Oh, that 
what's the place. There's a bit of male parlor chasing each other. It's actually sometimes it's worth just taking a moment or two next to these little bachelor the groups. It's going to get us into a better position. And the slightest little movement. Oh, and the zebras are going to come up to the open as well. Oh, working out perfectly now. And the slightest little movement between males can set off a train, chain reaction of chasing, snorting, and fighting. You can see they're so jumpy at the moment. Every time anyone gets near them, they sort of drop their head. Oh, see those two at the back there? They look like they've got something going on. <laughs> so jumpy at the moment. One impala runs and it's set off it. Set off the zebras. Some other zebras on the other side of the road. Ah, here comes the stallion. So he's not doing too well. He's only got one female, it looks like. So he'll defend that female against any other males. See that haze very clearly from up here, just on the edge of the horizon there. And don't forget, guys, fireside chat this evening. We haven't had one in a while, so it'd be good to catch up around the fire a little later. There, you see that haze we were talking about. All the dust that's been brought up by the wind. Let's see if we can find those elephants. As the zebras look like they're going to keep moving. Unfortunately, the Inkahumas uh, were found this morning. We had their tracks going across to the west into Sibambili. And they were chasing buffalo last night, but they weren't successful. So there is always a chance they might cross back. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Very interesting question. What is a sea pie? Uh, it's not the best example of one. I'll see if I can find a better one. So, Kathy, a sea pine is where water moves under the ground uh, towards uh, the beginning of a little creek or dry river system. So, here's a, a, a duplex soil. So, you've got sandy soils on top and clay soils underneath, and the water travels just below the surface. So, these areas are quite waterlogged, so you don't often get too many trees on them but you do get uh, very good grasses, so you often find big congregations of your grazing species on those areas. Just one little thing, and they all go off after each other. The males are so jumpy at the moment. But we're going to carry on looking at those elephants while we do that. Let's go back to James, who's still with those lazy leopards. 
Well, as you can see, everybody, absolutely nothing has happened here other than the sun moving slightly further down the horizon towards the west. These two leopards are fast asleep. Tingana has looked up once or twice to swat a fly. Tandi has variously put her head down to the side and then once on her front feet. Other than that, however, they have done nothing. Now, when I am around lions that are sleeping like this, I become immediately completely bored and wish to leave. But there's something about being around these leopards, even though they are flat and doing completely nothing, that is just still so appealing. I think it's the fact, first of all, that they are lying neatly like cats, as opposed to um, on their backs with their legs in the air or um, in and amongst their own sort of detritus, which lions tend to do. They still manage to look completely elegant to leopards. And I know that uh, many of us, our greatest fears are uh, being asleep in public because, you know, being asleep is often a very ele inelegant thing to do. You lie with your head back catching flies. A leopard manages to sleep with complete elegance. I don't know what on earth made me think of that, but, uh, you know, <laughs> so, so, so it goes. Uh, well, <laughs> now, Kathy in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, you want to know if leopards are more active during the day or during the night? Well, clearly this lot are particularly inactive during the day. Uh, Kathy, generally more active during the day, at least during the night. That's the more normal thing for leopards to do. You know, high action here. Yeah catching a fly. Oh, that's too sweet. Look, it looks like a little cuddly teddy bear. He isn't, of course. Um, Kathy? But, so most of the big cats active at night, lions and leopards. Cheetah active during the day. Leopards, however, will do a lot more during the day than will lions. So where they might lie like this for two or three hours, uh, with lions, you can be almost sure if you leave them in the morning as the heat starts to build, you'll find them again in the afternoon in exactly the same place. These leopards have moved quite far from where they were this morning. It's not only because they're mating, and we had an experience, Scott and I, the other day, uh, during Big Cat Week in November last year, when we were following Mvula during the day between drives, trying to make sure that we had him for the afternoon drive. And we followed him for six or seven hours. And he did all sorts of things. He moved all over the place. He moved up and down. He tried to have a bit of a hunt. He ate himself a monitor lizard. Then he lay under a tree for a while. Then he went to find a puddle to have a drink. And then he slept for an hour. And then he moved again. So they do move around a lot more than lions will during the course of a day. This lot doesn't look like it would ever move, but uh, they do move. Nice question, that. Thank you, Kathy. The weather is, uh, well, and I do mention the weather quite a lot, of course, but it's because it really does affect my mood. There is a, some cloudiness around. There is a front coming through. You can feel the wind. Well, you probably can't feel it, but you can certainly hear the wind and see it moving through the trees. And it's not a harbinger of much. Uh, just a front coming through, an autumnal front. And of course, in winter, we don't get much in the way of rain and bad weather. So that's not what it is. I used the term harbinger the other day uh, with a friend of mine, and um, she didn't know what it meant. So a harbinger. Brian, you know what a harbinger is, don't you? A very well-educated fellow you see as our Brian. Uh, a harbinger, of course, is a sign or a bringer of Exactly, like a crow, be a harbinger of death. I know one of our viewers is called Lady Macbeth. Macbeth, of course, the play is full of harbingers of doom. Hello, Survey. Survey, another great question from you. Do leopards suffer from diseases? Uh, yes, they do. They get 
or they can get something called feline AIDS or FIV, feline immunodeficiency syndrome, and that is a possibility. I think it comes initially, originally from domestic cats, but they can get it. They can also suffer from rabies. They can get um, tuberculosis, bovine tuberculosis, in much the same way that lions can. And so those are the main ones that they'd get. Uh, but in a natural situation, you will find that, you see, unlike with human beings, I find disease and parasites a really interesting subject because in a natural area like this, the animals are very well adapted to the parasites and the diseases that are here. In the absence of any kind of introduced pathogens, so say from domestic stock or from human beings themselves, there's a, I think there's a buffalo through there. I heard some movement through the bush where he's looking. So, I mean, they won't be particularly worried about that. But what that means, survey, is that while we get uh, colds and flu and uh, smallpox and chickenpox and measles and mumps and all these dread diseases, um, because a leopard or and many of these animals in the wilderness grow up in an area in which they've evolved to grow up, they don't eat badly, they eat what they evolved to eat, they don't breathe in toxic fumes or have cell phones plastered against their ears, their bodies cope with whatever parasites and diseases there are in a particular area. Now, unlike a human being, which now lives in a city where, of course, there are all sorts of pathogens we never evolved to deal with. There are pollutants that get into our lungs. There are allergens that get into our noses. We eat grains and wheat uh, genetically modified a lot of the time. And we drink and eat all sorts of things that our bodies can't cope with. And because of that, we get a lot sicker, I think, than most wild animals get. And that's no surprise to me that domestic animals get a lot sicker than wild animals because they live in the same kind of environment that we do. And even if you look at the kind of food that a domestic animal will eat, uh, domestic dog food, unless you're paying top dollar for the real kind of uh, top stuff, um, there's a lot of grain in it. And of course, a dog is not designed to eat grain or maize. So that's in a very long-winded way, survey, uh, the kind of story of disease in the leopards. High action here, look at Tingana. Isn't he a magnificent fellow? And you can just see her watching him, eyeballing him, and you can hardly see her eyes are open through those beautiful spots that she has. And I tell you, if we were to walk around the other side of this thicket here, we would hardly see her, we wouldn't see her. She would be invisible. And she does look rather like her mother and sister. Slightly, I hate to say this, but slightly pug-faced. <laughs> That's not to say that she's unattractive at all. Zoe, you're on Twitter, and I think many of our viewers own cats or certainly know about cats and are fascinated by them. And you say, do leopards ever chase their tails like a domestic cat might? As cubs, uh, yeah, as you say, Zoe, as cubs, they would certainly chase each other's tails. If they chase their own tails, but young cubs will definitely chase their tails of each of their siblings, I mean. She looks like she's starting to get a little bit mobile. Like she might be looking amorously at this hulking great fellow in front of her. Alternatively, she might just drop off. I'm not sure if a male leopard chasing flies off his face is attractive to a female leopard or not. Certainly a leopard has to make a male leopard has to make almost no effort whatsoever to seduce a female. Indeed, he does, doesn't do any of that sort of thing. Now, yesterday evening, of course, they were seen with or in the company of Karula. And it's the third or fourth time I've heard or seen Karula attending a mating pair. And it's normally because they are in the middle of her territory, and that's exactly what was going on yesterday. 
quite often you will find two females with a male if they come into estrus at the same time. And he's then required, of course, to perform double as much, which uh, must be pretty tiring for him. But it does happen like that. But in Karula's case, of course, she's probably just making sure that they're not going anywhere near her youngsters. I really hope we're going to see them soon. Like I say, they are two months old now. And so we'll chat about them a little bit at the fireside chat, which will begin in exactly 58 minutes, 48 minutes, everybody. Brian is nodding. Approvingly. Approvingly. The only worry about the fireside chat, of course, is that this wind is blowing from the southeast, and that means they're going to be crying with smoke. Don't worry, everyone. We will sally forth and bravely cope with the smoke from the fire. He looks to me like he's getting bored. Oh, here we go. Here we go. She'll turn over like that, flip onto her side and onto her back, just to help the process of fertilization, I think. And a very interesting question we had earlier, of course, of can this male possibly produce sufficient sperm to uh, every single mating opportunity? Uh, yeah, I mean, I gave my answer and I, I'm not actually sure. It's just so frequent. bit of sedges does look wonderful, doesn't it? Were there not two leopards here, I'd happily go and lie over there for a couple of hours, while away a beautiful afternoon in the low felt. Long whiskers, look at her whiskers. Here the rattling the stickle is going. Mm. You wondering about you not hearing any birds or squirrels? You are hearing a. Oh, here we go again. You are hearing rattling the stickle. They are most definitely calling, um, but no squirrels. On a cloudy day, they're probably sitting in the trees now. Look at that. He's not particularly interested at all, is he? Here we go. Doesn't take too much convincing. You saw how he grabbed her on the back of the neck there and held her down. So that she couldn't whip around and hit him. Now she'll roll over. There we go. Thank you for that, Andy. Not making me look like a total fool. Fantastic. I mean, we don't see this every day. So, he's the first driver. I hope you keep watching forever and ever, but don't expect this every single day. There will always be something exciting, but uh, this is exceptional. Now you might just be able to hear JDA. 
emerald spotted wood dove. <laughs> Way in the background, and then of course the roar of a Land Cruiser's diesel engine as it drives away. <laughs> All right, uh, wonderful news here. Let's head across to Brent Leo Smith. He's got my favorite animals, a Juma, at the moment. So we came to just have a quick look at some of the hyena den sites, and it is active. We're at the one they were last at off Aubrey's Road. So quite active. We've got four youngsters and sub-adults and one adult at the den. It's amazing how quickly these creatures grow. A few short months ago, they were tiny little black beings. Now all the spots are developed. Oh, and bravery is there. You're coming to say hello, little one. curious creatures, particularly young ones, and very playful as well. Sniffity sniff sniff sniff, probably smelling an anal pasting from one of the other individuals. So the smaller one is belongs to that female, so the bigger one is not. So hyenas, unlike lions, do not practice aloe suckling, so they will only suckle their own cubs, they will not suckle any other member of the clan's cubs. Now, one must remember that is a general rule, and all rules with nature can be broken, because they don't read the textbooks. little stick branch or anything around the den will be a, a play toy to the hyenas. We love to chew on just about everything. Even the adults are great chewers of things and anything left lying around in camp will happily be chewed. I think this particular clan of hyenas has removed a few shoes in their days. Chewed my toolbox once. There we are, chewed VM's toolbox once. I've seen what they can do to a camera bag. Someone left a camera bag in the lodge in Botswana once, and Aina got hold of it and literally crushed all the lenses and the camera. What you found? Really sniffing urine from another hyena or maybe even some vomit. Oh, we're going to have a bit of gammonship. There we go. As I said, any stick becomes a toy. <laughs> That's quite interesting, even though you can see a noticeable size difference between those two. Yeah, it seems the smaller one is the more dominant of the two, just because of the behavior there with the younger one. Now, the hierarchy with hyenas is inherited. So you will inherit the status of your mother. And there's very little movement in that.
Okay, well, we're going to sit here at the hind end for a little longer while we do that. Let's uh, jump back on board with James and the leopards. Keep it there. There, everybody, apparently is a pot plant, uh, <laughs> cunningly disguised as Brian's thumb. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it is... It is with the leopards. The leopards have mated once more. They are now in a post... Well, they're just in post-pleasure bliss at the moment, and they're asleep. We have to leave now. We need to go and set up the fire for the fireside chat, and we will therefore see you in the next 40 minutes or so. Brent Leo Smith, the inimitable, the highly enthusiastic, and Paul Kruger will be making their way down here to sit with them for the next half hour while we get everything set up. And we will see you then at the fire. Until then, bye-bye. So just getting a few snaps quickly of the rough and tumble that's going on there. Very, very cute behavior. Oh, looks like someone's charging in to join the fray. involved now. So while James charges off to set up a fireside chat, what would you guys like to do for the next little bit? Uh, do you want to stay with the hyenas? Would you like me to head back towards the leopards? Uh, just pop me an email or Use the hashtags Fry Live on Twitter uh, to let me know what we should do. What would you like to do? Would you spend, like to spend some more time with the hyenas or go back to the leopards? And the email address is question at wildearth.tv. Questions at wildearth.tv. So right, we'll sit here while we decide. As we sit at this hyena den, obviously there's quite a lot of hyenas that utilize it. And Cecilia is wondering, what does it smell like here? Actually not too bad. They don't defecate at their den site. So there's a bit of a urine smell, and sometimes a bit of a carrion smell when they bring stuff back. But it doesn't actually smell too bad at all. Hello. You're coming to inspect our vehicle. Where's the other one gone? Now, make sure they like to steal the little rubber caps off our tires. To make sure. Yeah, see, caught. Naughty. Naughty. And I knew you were up to mischief. Look at that face. Oh, well, now we've got Ford to keep an eye on, Vim. Oh, I want to give you a fright. Bit of a nervous nearly there, charged off. Sent the other three charging, then they sort of think, well, there's nothing to run away from. Okay, well, it seems like everyone would prefer to stay with the hyenas for a bit rather than race off after the leopards. And I agree, I haven't spent time at the den for quite a while, so quite nice to sit here catch up with uh, these comical characters. Oh, you're coming back in. I'm watching you. Yes, I can see you there. Stay away from my tires. Oh, oh there. Nervous Nelly is back out. Tennessee is wondering, are these the same hyenas that are also called laughing hyenas? It is. It is the spotted hyena, Crocutta Crocutta, uh, that is known for its maniacal giggles. Jim, check if, just watch that tire for me there. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. You have to be very conscious with these little guys. You can't see them, so they're literally right under the vehicle, right here. And we can't see them at the moment. 
And uh, they get the name Laughing Hyena from the maniacal cackling that they do when they're excited or scared. Oh, I can see one's popped its ear off there, somewhere, or through that gap. Them's watching our left tire, I'm watching the right, making sure we don't lose those little rubber caps and little oil seals. But I don't know why, wherever I've been in Africa and driving this particular type of vehicle, baby hyenas have always nicked those little oil cap, oil seals. Oh, there goes Nervous Nelly again for no reason. <laughs> they are so funny. The nice thing about social predators that you utilize dens, so like hyenas and wild dogs, it's really great to be able to get in and actually have a look at a little bit of the life. So you use communal den rather than denning by themselves. And there's always something going on. There's always a bit of interaction, a bit of thievery, a little bit of playfulness. Where are you coming now? So much fun. I just wish I could see them. Aha! I actually have a plan to see, to see if we can see what they're doing in front of our vehicle. Do you think it's going to work, VM? Yes. Okay, yeah, let's do this. We have a secret plan to see what's going on ahead of us. Okay, we are on it. Come up now. There should be four, and I can only see three. Okay, let's have a look if we can see where the other one is. Can't see it, but he's around there somewhere very close. Oh, look at that, look, sneaking for the tire. The little rascal. That little rascal. Yeah, you're busted, China. Oh, new hyenas just arrived at the den. Some greeting ceremonies taking place. I'm just going to keep quiet because they're often be quite vocal. Mm. I love the greeting ceremonies and hyenas. Look at that. It's just so fascinating. You can see showing submission to that female. Look at this, isn't this fantastic? There's another young sub adult popping its head out of the den itself. But we are no longer the most interesting thing at the den, and so they have gone to greet rather than terrorize our tires. An incredibly complex social. There we go, someone just got reprimanded.
So we've got five young youngsters out and two adults now. So it's always great to be at Hyena Den at this time of the day. Uh, there is quite often this wonderful activity. The females will come in before they head out. What is she? Oh, looks like we're back being popular again. Greasing over. But now I have my tool to make sure we don't get snuck attacked. So JD is wondering, do hyenas' spots fade with age? Uh, not, not the spots themselves. They actually start losing a lot of their their hair the older they get, particularly around their heads. Oh. Do we have another hyena coming in for a sneak attack? Just yet. Oh, what did she heard off in the distance there? See how suddenly all the ears pricked? Could it be an alarm call? Could it be a hyena calling? Now, some studies have shown, oh, there's another hyena coming. That's what it is. Coming in, there we go. It's a young-ish one, under a year old, or maybe around a year. Looks to be quite low ranking, immediately showing submission to the cubs. And you notice not nearly the same level of excitement as when that big female arrived. Look, the cub's tail's up. Excitement, they're going to start bullying it. And look at those little ones bullying the older one. That's a very sure sign in hyena behavior with that tail, those tails up like that. It's excitement. And the submission, submissive behavior is carrying on. For bullying going on, even though they're much smaller and definitely not as strong. But there's that inherited hierarchy at full swing. We just can't see them chasing it. We're actually going quite far from the den. I don't know if you can just make it up. Maybe if I drop this here. Yeah. There we go. too far from the den, but you can definitely see that poor bigger one is quite low ranking, being bullied by all four of the younger ones. That's the cool thing about hyenas and watching them. commented that the social structures are so interesting and they are highly amazing and also the most incredible thing once the only truly matriarchal female dominated society of all the animals we get out here at Juma the hyenas are the true queens and the females are bigger than males stronger than males they lead the clan Oh, 
you can see something there, Bian. What's going on? Don't need to move the. We just can't move the moment. There we go. So Teresa's wondering how the sort of hyenas work. Now, do they stay in a, in a clan is the correct uh, colloquial, I mean, collective colloquial, what nonsense I'm spewing, but the correct collective noun for hyenas. So the females will stay within their natal pack. The males will leave uh, once they get a bit older to go to a, a new clan uh, so they can breed. I was hoping these guys would come back charging. They might still. At the moment, we can only just stop the one female lying there, another one lying off just off to the, to the right. It looks like some of the little troubles are coming back. There we go. About to walk in from about behind this bush. Here it is. Now, if one of those, that bigger one, had sort of snapped back at those little ones, it would have elicited an immediate response from mom and it would have been a serious beating. There we go, another one coming back in. So Debbie says, what happens if the dominant female hyena is killed? Will her daughters retain her status? Yes, her eldest daughter or adult daughter, oldest adult daughter, will immediately fill in to the matriarchal position. Now, let's, are we going to eat it or are we going to roll in it today? No, we're going to roll in it. Now, hyenas love rolling in vomit. They do it often, and we do see them doing it. Uh, we've seen it then quite often. They sometimes will try to re-eat what they have thrown up, but the little guys just love rolling in it. Look at that. They're just fighting to roll in the vomit. Have a look what she's doing there. She's just behind that bush. I'm trying to see what she's up to. Oh, it seems that the, the good rolling session is over. And, uh, They're going to keep on playing around. There's a, a little girl saying goodbye to the baby hyenas. <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard that. I'm just saying bye-bye, bubbers. Bye. Well, maybe not. Still a bit more vomit to roll into.
looks like that, that hyena who is being bullied has decided to stay away rather than be bullied. Now, one of the more interesting facts about hyenas around a den. So, hyenas nurse for incredibly long time compared to most other predators. They can they nurse for over a year, but young hyenas that are born to high-ranking females. It looks like we're the popular people again. And let's set up our, our trap. Let's go. And they come closer. I know they stopped a little bit further away. But we can see and we can just check. See, we can now just check if there's any hyenas. Look at that. Look at them there. Look at that, smelling the bull bar. Fortunately, not going for the oil cap. Oh, he walked past it. It's going under the tire. I don't think this is worth recording. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? It's going under our vehicle. <laughs> don't rip any pipes or things out of there, please, little hyena. Oh, I think I just need to get moved. Oh, yeah. oh, I can just need to extend a bit. Sorry, guys. And go even higher. And you can see it. Just giving us a good, our vehicle a good sniff. And game over. Off the <laughs> way. Ah, we should have thought of this earlier, have you? When we get those things so close that we can't see. Pop this down. That black mamba. Like the black mamba. This would have been perfect for the black mamba. So we'll just leave that there just in case they do come back towards us. There's the bullied individual's back. Gail wants to know if we've ever seen a predator kill a hyena or come across a hyena carcass. Uh, we did. We found a hyena carcass last year, probably about this time. Um, around Shabam Road, and it looked like it had been killed by lions. I've seen lions kill adult hyenas before, and I think that's about the only, only thing that really kills hyenas apart from other hyenas, from the predators. And uh, there was a male lion where I used to live in Botswana who just had this thing. He just really didn't like hyenas. Someone got a fright, or, or got reprimanded. Mom's charging off to go see what did that. Tails are up. And if it was a subordinate hyena who did that, they're in for trouble. Because mom will sort them out. Oh, and they're charging off. Through there. Them. Oh, chasing the other hyena. Um, they just chased that other hyena. Another hyena came in and obviously didn't like being nipped or bullied by the little ones. Now all the adults have run off. The others are going down into the ground where safety it's safe let's go have a look around that side quickly see if we can catch up with that so that's it's always nice when you talk about something and the hyenas feel free, uh, choose to show you what's going on oh i can see another hyena running so hold on how we live here Here we 
go. Looks like it might be a little bit after the initial beating. And there's still tail signs of the tails going up. So they were very excited about sorting out whoever dished out that punishment to her cub. Well, well, it looks all over. I think there's the culprit who is looking sufficiently reprimanded. I'm not sure there. There was another hyena that's not here that I saw running. So very interesting little bit of behavior there. And anyhow, I think it's getting quite dark. Oh, well spotted VM. A family of giraffe watching the hyena ongoings. Go. They got a nice vantage point, like my pole I was using there. And so let's have a quick look at these uh, giraffe. Oh, and here we go. Watching the hyena again intently. See, I think I went a bit too far. I can't see the baby. But I'll have a quick look at these giraffe, and then I'm going to start slowly making my way towards the fireside chat to join a gems and gemma around the fire. So a lot of people have been asking where the giraffe are. Well, with this green flush, like we're not seeing too many zebras, we're not seeing too many giraffe. Oh, have you got a bone? Is that what you are chewing? Nope. And quite often you'll find Oh, hyena's starting to call. Ooh. Let's maybe go one little glass at the hyena den before we head to fireside chat. But the giraffe, like the zebra and wildebeest, once we've had a bit of rain and there's a lot of green flush around, uh, will spread out. And when we remember our area, we are mostly what we call broad-leaved woodland. Uh, we're not blessed with hundreds of acacia species, so our giraffe population is always going to be a relatively small one on the tuna. Debbie, yes, they will occasionally, not all the time. Hoping we get one last little bit of vocalization before we have to shoot off. There we go. It's that low greeting vocalization. drink as well. <laughs> that wasn't a very serious reprimand. Good breaks, guys. That was more mom saying, enough now. You're biting too sore. So Tony is wondering, that rolling in vomit, is that not a type of scent masking tactic? Uh, I don't think so, Tony. Uh, hyenas are not too worried of animals and smell them. They're not ambush predators. Uh, I think they just really like smelly things. Uh, rotting carcasses, vomit, 
seeing them roll in lion dung, leopard dung. So I just like smelly things. Like dogs, just like smelly things. <laughs> Mom, I'm thirsty. Oh, biting mom's ear. Yeah. Very tender little moment. Now, stop harassing me, children. I've been a busy day. So guys, it's nearly time for fireside chat, so we're gonna leave the lovely hyenas. It is also getting a little bit dark. It's gonna, it's about six minutes to go. It's gonna take me a little while to get there. So, although, do you think, do you think that James and Jamie would forgive me if I was a little bit late? I think they would. Chantal and Carol. Uh, we should have probably explained. We've got lots of new viewers. Oh, welcome, uh, Chantal and Carol. They're in Cape Town. They say, when you're here, how and what and where do we see the fireside chat? You just stay right where you are, and we will bring it to you. So once there, James and Jamie are set up and got a, a lovely roaring campfire, although I think we might be crying through the smoke in this gusty wind this evening. Uh, we will cut across to them, so, and then I will try a race to get there, so I'm not too late. But you don't have to move a muscle. Stay, stay, stay tuned to Safari Live to see uh, the fireside chat. So it's just a little catch up on what's been going on. Mostly we're focusing on leopards, this fireside chat. A little chat about Kojima, uh, and of course Karula and Shadow and their, their cubs, and also and uh, the males, Tingana, and what's been going on in, in, in his world as well. So just a nice little roundup on leopards at the moment. And James was probably is going to play us a song as well, which generally means he's going to try and make me do something ridiculous, which fortunately I, I, I generally do. For, for, fortunately for you, not for me, I, I end up looking a little silly. But anyway, lots of fun. We haven't done one in a while, so we thought it'd be nice to, to have a Sunday night fireside chat. Leaving Nisika Aubrey, still active. Starting to get slightly dark. Now, that's of course also because of the cloud that has come in and quite a rate of knots. And again, I don't think there's much rain in it. And you can see those wind, the wind whipping through the trees. I'm quite glad I'm going towards the fire. I forgot my jersey this afternoon. So I think, is this day two of, of, of the current cat streak, Vim? 
Yeah, this is day two. This is day two. So we were on a bit of a roll with big cats. We had eight days in a row where we either had lion or leopard or both. And uh, we are striving to beat the record from last year, which was 28 days on the trot with big cats. So fingers crossed. Let's see, hopefully Lady Luck is on our side for this one. still a tiny bit of water left here. Now, no, there's not. It's just a piece of elephant dung that looked like water. Now, can you believe we were filming a crab swimming around under the water here less than a week ago and looking for frogs? Now, the sun has evaporated that water quite quickly. Exciting. Who knows what tomorrow morning might hold for us. Uh, I know a lot of you have been missing your hyena fix, and it was a particularly lovely little hyena fix we got this sunset safari. Uh, couldn't find those ellies though, but there's always tomorrow. going to be a little bit chilly tonight. I think I might have to find it. Take the blanket out of the cupboard. We haven't used blankets for many months now. Very, very warm. So I'm going to speed up. Uh, while I speed up, let's jump, or not jump on. Let's go sit next to the fire with James and Jamie. Hello, everybody, and Hello. welcome to the Fireside Chat, the 7,486th edition thereof, <laughs> on this autumnal evening. A wind blowing in from the southeast, bringing with it the promise of not much except slightly cooler weather today. I don't think it's going to rain, do you? I don't. I'm just glad it's not blowing the smoke yes, into our faces. It is blowing that way. You don't have to watch way. us weep yes. through Fireside Chat. We'll put Brent there, though, so in case you do want to watch someone weep, <laughs> Brent will be in tears by the end of the drive. <laughs> uh, at least the end of the fireside chat. So a jam-packed full show we have for you tonight, of course. I, you're supposed to say that when you're hosting these things. Absolutely. Basically, we're going to be talking about leopards. We've got a number of different leopard clips to show you. We'll be looking at the habituation of the runner, a.k.a. Gijima. Mm -hmm. That is the Zulu term for run. We'll be looking at Karula and chatting a little bit about her babies. And obviously we can talk about the imminent, perhaps, babies. So we'll talk about the mating that's been going on with Tingana and Tandi. And then, of course, Tandi, at least Tingana's other offspring with Shadow in the culvert on a particularly stupid piece of ground. We'll talk about the stupidity of the den sites chosen by the uh, genetic legacy that is the Karula dynasty. And then we have another one. That's a bit of leopard comedy for you. Uh, Tingana attempting to do things which a leopard should find relatively easy, but so far has failed to do so this week. questions about the leopards or indeed anything to do with Safari Live while we're sitting here next to this fire for the next uh, 25 or 30 minutes, that would be marvellous. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv or you can talk to us on the YouTube chat stream. I don't know why I find that so difficult to say, <laughs> but I get it wrong just about you, every you mix time. It up all, I the say time. It all the time. You chat tube stream. I say the chat tube stream. There's an yeah. elephant chasing the zebra around. So there is. The clearing. Yes, there is an elephant, very cross, chasing zebra. The zebra are coming this way. <laughs> it's a stampede. It is a stampede. It's actually quite impressive. It's lovely. It's, I'm sorry. Oh, Brian's, Brian's filming him. <laughs> Brian's you gone You see, Brian way. is extremely skilled. Well done, Brian. 
Excellent work. <laughs> Good job. I promise you there was an elephant there though, just to clarify, because I'm not sure you can yes. see it. I can't see it. Um, but there is uh, the blinding lights of Brent Leo Smith on his way here in the recalcitrant Rusty. So pleased that the hyenas I know, are back. I know, it's the most exciting moment of my Isn't day. Isn't it wonderful? I went rushing there yesterday afternoon after I heard that news and I got there and there was nobody, there was nobody home. No, no. It was terribly disappointing, Dreadfully but they're back. Sad. Yes, they, they are, are back. And Kirsten says they've grown substantially in the last two weeks, which I suppose you won't notice the difference too much, but you haven't been away for two weeks. And I they... don't know, I feel like if I miss out on them for two days, mm. they've grown. It is it's amazing. astounding. Yeah. And we'll probably have some new ones even. I mean, uh, that clan seems to be multiplying at a quite terrific rate. Anyway, I think while we wait for Brent Leo Smith to come in here, he's going to tell us all about the habituation of leopards. But while we sort of wire him up, as it were, let's have a look at the clip of this magnificent new male leopard called Gijima. Have a look at So I'm actually going to just try to sneak forward an inch so you can see his face. But I'm going to stay far away. There we go. So it's very, very important when dealing with unrelaxed animals, and with all animals, in fact, is not to drive straight at them. So I'm just going to keep talking normally, and this is one of the best ways to habituate an unrelaxed male leopard. And you can see there, he's, he's moving his head, trying to get a reaction from us to see if we've actually spotted him. So you can see this is a really huge progress. Uh, he hasn't run away from us, he's stood up and he's walked away from us. So that's a massive, massive bit of progress. The fact that he's laid down flat, he's not nearly as perturbed with our presence as he was a bit earlier. And while we've been sitting here, I've been slowly speaking a little bit louder and a little bit louder, just to get him used to the sound of a human voice. It's just hope he relaxes and carries on feeding. I don't want him to rush down the tree, so I'm not going to move at all from where I am now. Look at that, isn't that incredible? Look at this, guys, we're so much closer, and he's almost giving us the quintessential leopard silhouette. And look at that, he's still feeding. Uh, we're probably about, we'll wait for it here. It comes the back of the leopard ears in the fork of the tree with the fading light behind him. There it is. Isn't this amazing? Just that little bit of patience has really paid off with this guy. We're now probably 50% closer than where we were. Right, hello everybody. So a magnificent sort of clip there, I think. I mean, not the most impressive visuals of a leopard that you've ever seen, but some highly so skilled excited. operations from the man to my left-hand side, currently sitting in the smoke, Brent Leo Smith. Oh, thank you very much, James, yes. and hello everyone. Now, I know you just saw me, but I magically appeared out of the darkness. Yeah, it was a really, really uh, exciting and, and thrilling experience. I do love habituating leopards, and I, I've been fortunate enough to do it in some other places in Africa. And, and patience is key, and with a lot of what we do out here, seeing those incredible sightings, getting close to animals, you must realize there's been a lot of work and a lot of patience that has gone into this. Uh, so we are able to bring you these fantastic visuals all the way from deepest, darkest. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> I think in the Sabi sands, of course, we don't yeah. have to do it as often as this because yeah. we see them from when they are tiny little cubs. And so the leopards kind of grow up very used to us. So, I mean, where do you think Gajimas come from? I guess Kruger, in the most sense. I mean, uh, from the point where we have been seeing them around the Buffalo's Hook water hole, it's probably about four kilometers to the, the mm. Kruger boundary. And there's no tourist roads in that western section of Kruger. There's no private concessions there. So very possibly he's, a, he's been living in one of those wilderness areas in the Kruger National Park that people never get to go to. So I mean, by wilderness area, Brent means, of course, an area where people are not allowed to go. So they have a few of them in the Kruger where there's no walking, there is no driving, and just researchers go in every so often. So I think that's probably exactly where he's come from. And you reckon he's how old? But Close to five, I'd say, four yeah. to five years old. Closer yeah. to the five side. He hasn't quite get, got the mm. dewlap, but it's, it's on its way. And he looks to be in pretty good condition too. Beautiful. Yeah. And also no big nicks on his ears, mm. no big scratches. So I don't think he's challenging for territory just yeah. yet. Um, so there were reports of Krula mating with an unrelaxed male in the north. I don't think it's him. I think it's another one. I don't think he's old enough yet. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Very interesting. 
Have you had any experience of habituating leopards? Or am I dropping I, you in it now? No, I, I <laughs> confess, I absolutely do not. I've seen okay. lots of unrelaxed leopards racing across the road and okay. then coming, you know, going and watching them disappear into the bush yeah. in front of me. But I've never spent a great deal of time with unrelaxed mm. leopards. I've never been lucky enough to have the opportunity. I have to confess, I haven't done a huge amount of it either, simply because I haven't, I mean, most of my work has been around here in the Timbavati up north and the Sabi Sands here. And because we see them from so young, uh, yeah, we often don't take the time to habituate them. The other thing is, of course, Gajima lives largely on Biffle's Hook, which is a, it's not quite as actively tracked as Juma is or as I suppose Torchwood is to some extent, but nothing like the southern reserves there of Cheetah Plains and Chitwa Chitwa and those properties where Arethusa traverses and indeed further south onto the river where Londolozi and Malamala operate. So I think that's rather a fascinating new development going on here. And whether or not he was the one mating with Karula is interesting. Now, you were seeing Mvula while I was away. Yes. Now, Mvula has, has regressed, so he's, he's become a dispersal male again, like he would have been when he was uh, young. So as he was moving around, he would have snuck between other males' territories. And now, as he's got old, and Tungana has literally forced him out of the 90, well, no, 99% of his territory, and then Shivambalan, which is one of Kula's offspring, is coming back from the Kruger and pushing. And he had that little spot around Cheetah Plains mm. where he seemed to avoid... But now Shivambalan and Tingana have been seen there in the last two weeks. So he is literally popping up everywhere. He even popped out well inside Anderson's territory, mm. I, I heard from the guys in the west. So that's interesting. By dispersal, I mean, you called him a dispersal male, did you? Yeah. I mean, basically a male without territory, without fixed abode, as it were. And that's because he ain't a young man anymore. And we reckon the Panthera guy says about 13, 13 yeah. which is a pretty good age for a male leopard. Now, you were at a rangers meeting recently. We've got a question from Susie regarding Kwatile and what's happened to her. Were there any updates from there? It, it seems very much a very sad situation. For those of you who missed it, Kwatile was a female leopard that we hardly ever saw. Mm. Very beautiful. She's sort of heard the top of her territory just touched on our southern boundary of Arethusa. But we had a report from some of the guides a couple of weeks ago that she had been suspected bitten by a snake and that she wasn't looking good in the last sighting that she was seen in. And she hasn't been seen since. Oh, oh. such a cross elephant. <laughs> There's an <laughs> elephant there chasing the zebra still. <laughs> okay. um, and we might stoke the fire. Um, <laughs> slight distraction there. Um, so it does seem as though, it's a very sad situation, it does seem as though that Quitile has died and because she had three small cubs it's mm. most likely, well it, it's absolutely certain if she has died they will also yeah. have died at some point along the line. And we did have some questions a little bit earlier about would we go and rescue those cubs and of course no we wouldn't. And there are a number of reasons for that, uh, the most obvious being of course that these things normally end in tragedy and B, uh, where would we put them? Would we subject them to a life of living in a rehabilitation centre for the rest of their days? And that's not anything against rehab centres, but it's not necessarily the life that a leopard was born to. But it's not all doom and gloom. It is not. No. Um, I saw, yesterday I was very lucky and some friends took me on a game drive and I saw uh, her last daughter who's moved into her ter territory, a female by the name of Takani. So she's about three years old now and she's basically taken over the core mm. of Quatila's territory already. And does she have that beautiful golden colour? She's very pretty. Leopard. The legacy of the sunset bend female, female from Longer River Lozzi. leopards. Oh. Wonderful. Marvellous. Just so gold compared with the yellow legacy that is Karula's, mm. basically. The very kind of pale yellow, lemon yellow versus that golden. So distinctive. It is. It's incredible. And in the Sabi Sands, it's even, even at Long Lozzi, you, you had both of those legacies side mm. by side. Like, yes. And very visible. Yeah. Right, we're going to move on to our next section here, and this is the clip of Karula. Again, not wonderful visuals, but just lovely to see her again. Have a look. Ooh, is she going to take it up a tree? Is she going to take it into this Tamboti? Come on, girl, that's a good idea. She is looking up into the tree, and that Tamboti would be a perfect spot for her to hide a kill like this. Here she goes. She's gonna take it up into the tree. 
Away she goes. Awesome. Yay, that's exactly what we want to see. So that she doesn't run the risk of losing it to any raging lions or hyenas. Well done, Karula. It was an absolutely magical sighting that we enjoyed. She actually gave us a serious run around that morning. Brent may or may not have found himself slightly with a wheel in the air in the drainage line, trying to follow up on monkey alarm calls. And we went back there that afternoon and we found her on a Nyala kill. And just watching her, just seeing her hoist that kill, seeing her looking after herself, she left that kill that night, went straight back to where she's keeping her cubs to the south of our boundary around Little Gowrie, and then walked the precise on top of her track. She walked the exact same path back again. Back again. I found her tracks and then I found her on the road, walking over her tracks. It was incredible. And so nice to spend a bit more time with her. I haven't seen her in a really long time. And an adult, Nyala. Uh, it was a baby Nyala. Baby Nyala. Yeah, okay. very young. Marvellous. So her cubs seem to be fine and they had their second month birth, birth the tomorrow. Second? Or today? Today is the second. third. Uh, yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, yes. yes. Yes, yesterday. They were two months old yesterday. So like I said yesterday on Drive, we will be viewing them if we see them again. And you've had reports of them climbing trees Climbing already. trees. They were found this, this morning at the tip top of a marula tree, apparently chasing each other in play. So <laughs> well, this is exciting. This that is, is wonderful. This is the reason we wait for that yeah. two-month period. It, it gives them that, that mm. extra bit of opportunity. If a hyena happens into a, or a lion, they are able to get up the trees. But a good opportunity there will segue into the idiocy <laughs> with which those two leopards have chosen their dens. Yes. <laughs> Both in culverts I'd, on I'd... main roads. Shadow at the moment on... The triple M break, right? Yes. And, and how long has she been there? About a week or so, I would say. And it's fascinating. Both Karula and Shadow have done exactly the same thing, both on main roads, not in the same place, but still around these culverts in the main road where they're delivery trucks. There's constant traffic. And I've been racking my brains trying to think if there's any logic behind mm. it, and I, I don't think so. I think it's just... And it's also it's a main highway for the lions of the reserve yeah. as well. That to me is what's so odd about it. But I mean, to me, the logic is that a leopard is not a digger, really. No. And so while Shadow did give birth in a termite mine, I've actually never heard of that happening before. You have, but I'd never heard of that before. Um, caves and little places where they can, you know, put their little cubs are in short order here. There are not many of them around. Mm -hmm. So those culverts are obviously seemingly ready made. They're so used to the vehicles, they don't give a, give a continental about the vehicles. Yeah, and that's, that's how it is. Very, very. Yeah. I mean, the male lions walked over the top of those yeah. cubs. Uh, the that's, Birmingham boys. That is the one thing, is that they're a major, major lion highway as well. Yeah. Now, Michelle, you're in Sweden, and your question has slipped my mind. I'm hoping Brent has got it. <laughs> no, I thought you were listening. Uh, uh, oh, no, I got it. I remember it now. <laughs> Michelle, I'm going to pass it to Brent. Uh, Michelle would like to know, Brent, will those cubs be travelling to kills at this age? Well, with um, Shadow, definitely not. They're still far too young. Karula, I'm, I have seen them that young, but I would probably say maybe another couple of weeks before she's going to start moving them big distances. Uh, but I have seen cubs that young being moved before. Actually, we were talking about Sunset Bend female. Uh, her daughter they used to take them um, from even younger than two months mm. onto kills. So, so I mean, they'll start eating meat at sort of four weeks, basically, yeah. if it's around, but they will only wean at three months or just over. And, I mean, that's pretty early, if you think about it. A hyena is six months, yep. and uh, we are, of course, uh, between two years and four years, in the case <laughs> of some people. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> lions also have very little time. So they do have to wean very quickly. They do have to get onto meat in a, in a very quickly indeed. And then, of course, the possibility of new cubs, possibly. Yes. Now, we'll have yes. a look a little bit later just after the comedy of Tingana, <laughs> we'll have a look a little bit later at some of the mating that's been going on between Tandi and Tingana, and that, of course, is hopefully going to play into some more cubs for us to watch. So we'll have hopefully six or seven to view every single day for the oh. next two years. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, well, that's a very exciting Lenar's. prospect. Right. On that note, let's go and have a look at Tingana and his slightly comical behaviour with a hapless and very dead very heavy warthog. And he has eaten a fair whack of it already. And 
hopefully he is going to hoist this one, unlike the last kill we had with him. Oh, he's going to move the carcass. Look at those flies. No, silly, there's a branch in the way. <laughs> yes, no, that's not, not showing that you're a very clever leopard, my friend. But he's big, so brute power is what he will use. Brute strength. <laughs> this is quite amusing. Yes, no one ever accused royalty of being smart, so he is definitely the king of Juma, although not using his brain at the moment. Oh, look, 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 this is amazing. Go on, take it up, boy. Look at the strength. I'm not going to move everybody, let's just wait. He's taken it right to the base and he's been eating very kind of uneasily, looking around, looking around. Maybe he can smell a hyena. But suddenly flies have exploded into the air off that carcass. Here he goes. There he goes. Oh, that's beautiful. That is just fantastic. Oh, come on. That, that is, that's not very impressive at all. So that was possibly one of the more comical moments I've had with a, a big male leopard like that. Um, one would think he, he could have figured that out, but I suppose we are all allowed a, a sort of a silly day. But it was amazing. He sort of reminded me of one of the bigger dogs I had as a kid, a boar bull. And sort of holding on to the end of a rope and not letting go. And then sort of eventually you just say, okay, if I just keep pulling, it's going gonna to work. No. Nope. So shake it again, and it was just, he just wasn't having a good day, as you found later on that, yeah, ridiculous. that, that evening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've, I drove once a big cat trainer who told me that a leopard was as clever as a dolphin. Tingana is not in that <laughs> class. He's, uh, he's, uh, that was not a complicated puzzle to work out. That was pretty gormless behavior. Uh, he then climbed the tree with the pig. He'd eaten, well, a good probably uh, another quarter of it or so. So it probably weighed, I mean, that was a big warthog, so let's say between 90 and 100 kilograms, almost 200 pounds, um, if it was a big adult, and I think it, it looked was, like a big adult. Um, and he then tried to take it up the tree. And why he let go, I don't know. Um, if he was just having a weak moment, if his claws were a bit blunt at the moment, I don't know what it was, but it was... The funny part of that, of course, is that he looked so embarrassed at the end of it. And, well, he should have, because it was not a particularly impressive attempt. Now, a leopard, of course, is able to lift twice its own body weight yeah. in theory, but, I mean, I, I'm, I've never been a... Mm. I've never believed that. Because, I mean, in Tingana's case, that would probably be a 150-kilogram animal. That's He's not going to lift no, up. No, no, I mean, that's the size of an adult female kudu. If it was Mr. Anderson, on the other hand, you know. Well, know. yes, but he is he's, a big he fellow, hoisted a baby giraffe. Did he? <laughs> Straight up. Really? Yeah. So a baby giraffe, when it's born, is about 100 kilos as well, yeah. so yeah. that's 220 pounds, so that's pretty impressive. Right. We weren't going to show you this today because we saw the mating leopards this morning. Well, you saw them, you saw a bush moving. I saw a bush moving and some noise coming from the right. general vicinity. Okay. That and was the extent of the sighting this right. morning. This afternoon, Brent fearlessly went in on foot and managed to find them, which was a great relief to all of us because we got to spend a good deal of time with Tingana and Tundi. So have a look at this very new spanky clip. Oh, here we go. Here we go. What I meant there was spanky new clip. I'm not sure what a spanky clip is to be. So, so if you just, if you could, if the trouble with being live, of course, is that you can't take it back. Whatever you say is now in the ether forever and ever. So if you could blot that from your memories, that would be great. I don't know what a spanky clip is. Brent, can you talk us through your I'll emotions? Never it. Oh, well, can we, you have not forgotten it already. 
Could you talk us through, rather, your experience of walking in on them on foot? Well, as you know, this wind has been tearing around today, and it's, and it's quite gusty, so it's not in a single direction. And the last time I walked in there was before all this rain, and it wasn't quite so intimidating. But uh, I normally track quite quickly, but today I really took my time. I mean, one foot in front of each other, stop, listen. I won't lie, when I spotted them, and they hadn't spotted me, my heart rate definitely climbed a little bit because as I sort of turned away to start walking out of the block they started mating so, <laughs> so that yeah. noise I was like oh, turn around okay no listen, they haven't seen me yet <laughs> let me go around they weren't and chasing I'll... you, you no they weren't chasing me <laughs> yes. and, uh, what a deep relief that must have been <laughs> yes. yes and then they came out into the open and of course we sat there with them for a good two and a half hours and wonderful mated a number of times uh, which was very interesting, and it's always interesting. Now, Tandy, if I'm not mistaken, is Shadow's yes. sister, correct? Yep. From the same litter. From the same litter. So they are full sisters. And, of course, we're not sure exactly who the father of Karula is, but there is a possibility, of course, that Karula, Tandy and Shadow are not just mother and two daughters, but indeed mother, daughters and sisters, which immediately complicates the relationship <laughs> between all of their cubs but we won't necessarily go down that route. But it is interesting because, of course, it's not a problem for leopards or any other cat for, they say, six generations. Six mm. generations. And it is just they don't live off the same standards we do. Yes. And what's interesting is Tingana's mated with all three of them, yeah. Karula, Shadow and Tandi. So at least despite his clumsiness, the ladies are still finding him yes. more appealing. Yeah, even though he can't tree a warthog and has the uh, sort of puzzle-solving ability of a completely gormless piece of wood. He's like um, a bodybuilder. He's he buff is. and he's buff. pretty, yeah. and uh, he's just not much between the ears. No, <laughs> no, not at all. And his size, um, do you compare his size with Anderson and with Mvula? Um, the... Sorry, I got completely, just completely so distracted Have you there. seen Anderson? I've never seen Anderson. Okay. So, I've he's heard big. stories. He's bigger. He's much bigger. Uh, he's bigger than the biggest male leopard I thought could not get a bigger male leopard, which was the Campan male. And I've actually compared photographs of them at the same age, and he is physically quite a lot mm. bigger. And when you see his neck, I mean, he, look, he looks like a lioness. I mean, and I'm, yeah. I, I'd, guess, I'd guess him. I mean, it's very difficult to be completely accurate. I'd say Tingana is probably 80 to 85 kilograms. Do you think that big? Yeah, I do. I think it just, he's just okay. got that weight. And I think Anderson's over 90, which okay. is a monster as yeah. leopards go. I think the, the largest leopard ever, ever recorded was 98 kilograms. Yeah. So, um, very interesting. How, how big? 98. 98. Okay. Sure. That's, a, that's, that's a bust. That's bigger than me. Uh, well, that's not hard. It's <laughs> definitely bigger than Jamie. Definitely bigger than um, Jen B, quickly, uh, you wanted to know about, well, give, given the fact that Tingana is mating with all three of these females, is that not a problem for genetic diversity? Uh, in a human population, it might be, but um, not with a leopard population. Chances are, of course, he is now nine years old. Um, he will probably not last beyond 13. Uh, he's almost 10, so, I mean, that's three years. By the time, if there are females in these two litters, or three litters, hopefully soon, if they, are, if they do come to maturity, yes, he might mate with them, but... There, that kind of, a, well, I don't like to use the uh, term incest, I meant inbreeding, will not then carry on because he will have to remove himself after that. So it's not, I mean, it, from a human population point of view and probably many mammals it would be a problem, but for the cats, not so much. Right, it is now time uh, for a little song, just to, before we say goodbye to you. Well, it's my favourite time, you chaps, of course. Brentley O. Smith sometimes dances for us, you might do that tonight. I'm trying to convince Jamie that she should sing for us, of course. Which should um, be the equivalent of Tingana's comedy hour, just different. Uh, no, that's, that's Brent playing the drums. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Scott playing the drums. <laughs> the song I've chosen for you... To, uh, very rude, because he's not here. Um, the song I've chosen is from that wonderful Paul Simon album, Graceland, and it is called The Boy in the Bubble, the opening track. A beautiful song. Thank you very much for a wonderful week. It's been lovely to be back here. Well, I've only been back for four days or so. But we will see you tomorrow, Monday, uh, which is the same as every other day for us. Pretty much. Uh, We're very at lucky. six o'clock in the morning. Stay safe and happy wherever you are. This is The Boy in the Bubble by Paul Simon. <laughs> Anytime. Oh, well, how did you get